Okay, it's uh, great to see uh, everybody here. Uh, actually, um, I, uh, this is a, a very special event. Uh, we're going to have uh, Professor uh, Saif Salahuddin uh, talk about uh, negative capacitance. Uh, now, I can tell you uh, a little bit about this, is that it doesn't happen very often that during somebody's PhD work, they do something uh, so fundamental that they change the trajectory of a major industry like the electronics industry. Uh, so Saif is one of those people, when he was just a graduate student, he stumbled across an idea uh, of uh, that magnitude, and it's called the negative capacitance. Now, uh, of course, when he came up with this idea, people said, that's crazy. Negative capacitance, never heard of negative capacitance. And so, like every great idea, uh, you can measure its greatness by how much resistance it engenders. And this created a huge amount of resistance uh, in, in the field. And um, uh, within uh, uh, the uh, faculty here at uh, Berkeley, though, we recognized that this was a terrific idea from a, a terrific uh, new faculty member. So uh, we uh, recruited him uh, very strongly. And um, uh, the, uh, the idea evolved and is now emerging to be a very important uh, new idea uh, in transistors. You know, things in transistors change very infrequently. So here is a very big change that's uh, coming uh, forward. And so for that, let me ask uh, Professor Salahuddin to come up and tell us what's going on. Let's Is it on? Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. That's better. All right. Okay. Um, so let me um, let me start uh, with that uh, a little bit of hiccup. So you know, uh, every time we give a presentation, our uh, propaganda slides change. So now is the time of uh, uh, big data. So I thought it is obligatory to show something that that says abundance of data, but. Uh, the main thing is yes, uh, uh, we are uh, we we uh, these days we have a lot of data that needs to be processed. We are we are generating data in various ways, and in some um, sense, where things get very quantitative is actually scientific computing. So this is this data. This um, you know this uh, slide does not show very well, but essentially what it is showing is in in the in the advanced um, accelerators in uh, Department of Energy uh, facilities, the amount of data that they think will be generated. So this is 700 petabytes. I don't know if you can see the y-axis by 2028. And in a recent workshop uh, by uh, DOE on microelectronics, DOE challenged us that can you actually process 10 petabytes per second? I think you need to tell us how much is a peta. <laughs> One in fifteenth is one peta, and if you actually think about how much energy that takes, ten petabytes per second. If you think on average fifty picojoules per bit, that's a fifty kilowatt energy, right? And they think that that amount of data will be created inside their accelerators. So you need a data processing computer which is uh, inside there, and of course we cannot put fifty kilowatt inside the Large Hadron um, Collider or you know even our small um, uh, accelerators in the US. So there is a big need for uh, processing a lot of data. Okay? Now, <clears throat> the fact that we actually talk about uh, uh, processing this kind of data has to do, actually one of the main uh, enablers for that is that the computing hardware has been advancing despite a um, lot of negative news, Moore's law is dying, this and that. It, it has been advancing for many decades. And um, I took this from the, um, from the Wikipedia. Uh, the first ImageNet paper, right, uh, what they're saying, this was made feasible due to the utilization of GPUs, right? So GPUs made, the, made it possible to actually process that amount of parameters in a reasonable amount of time. And if you look at one of these uh, modern GPUs, um, so this is the NVIDIA Volta. Uh, this is from their website, 21 billion transistors. 
this is actually made of 21 billion FinFETs, which came out of Berkeley, right? So if you think about it, that there are 21 billion uh, transistors working together and not failing is a, is a mind-boggling statistic. So um, this I took uh, from uh, Lisa Su's uh, presentation at uh, this recent DARPA ERI summit in June. Uh, Lisa Su uh, is the CEO of AMD. And what uh, the point she was making that where is this performance gain in the computers coming from over the last decade, right? And if you look at it, there is 40% from process technology, then 8% from bigger die size, 12%, uh, so 12% from bigger die size, and 8% from additional uh, <coughs> die packaging and other things. So that is a process technology itself. And the power management, which is uh, around 15%, is also coming from advances in the device technology. So what this is saying is that this performance gain in computing, almost 75% of it is basically coming from devices and materials Okay, in the, in the last one decade. Uh, of course, there is, um, there is a performance improvement coming from the architecture, ar architectural de design and software, but according to her, 75% uh, at least from AMD's data is coming from the uh, device materials technology, which is again, uh, uh, very interesting. So for the technologists like me, what does it mean, um, these advances in technology, right? Uh, one way to summarize that is basically this. You look at the uh, SRAM cell size over the years, it's continuing to go down, right? If you, uh, if you talk about Moore's law, people will say Moore's law died, some people will say in 2005. Uh, Moore's law will be dead, uh, some others will say Moore's law will be dead in the next three years, right? Moore's law uh, is always dying, except that the SRAM cell size is actually going down in a log scale all the time. So this, uh, for a technologist, is actually the advance because what, is, what this is doing is giving you a lot of memory in the same area. And anything you are doing, if you are an AI enthusiast, you are doing training, you are doing inferencing, you are doing all of that on that, on that SRAM. So SRAM, uh, as long as this is going down, uh, you are actually getting a uh, performance benefit. So of course, uh, integrating more devices in the same area um, is problematic because you have to lithographically create it. So if you are following the trend uh, today, the, uh, the companies are going to UV lithography. So our um, you know, Jeff Booker at some point worked on these uh, UV lithography techniques. UV lithography is very expensive, so that's making the chip uh, manufacturing very expensive. But uh, those are these challenges of uh, making things smaller and smaller. But there are some physics issues uh, in terms of making things smaller and smaller. So our transistors are essentially a switch. Basically, a current is flowing between source and drain. And you want to use a gate to control that current through this channel. That's a, that's a very simple idea. So usually, long time ago, the source and drain will be very far apart. And this gate will be very close to the channel. So if you think about 20 years ago, this will be, uh, say, 250 nanometer away, this will be 5 nanometer or 6 nanometer. So gate will control this very well. But as we are shrinking the device side, this drain is actually coming closer and closer to the channel. So now the drain also controls how the current will go through the channel in addition to the uh, gate. Okay. So this is kind of shown in this data where it is showing that if you have a 1 micron channel length device, this is the off current, this is the on current. But if you go to 320 nanometers, the on current is slightly improved, but the off current has gone up significantly. In other words, you have lost the on-off ratio. So this is for 320 nanometers. Today, devices are around 18 nanometer long physical length, 18, 1, 8. So if you followed this curve, you will hardly be able to see any on-off ratio. Okay? So how do I solve this problem? Of course, somehow I have to make my gate stronger. And that came from these, uh, you know, the way people looked at this problem is making this gate control stronger is that I have to increase CX somehow. So how do I increase CX? 
Uh, capacitance, very simple. I have the permittivity of the material divided by thickness of the material. If I want to increase C ox, I want to reduce the thickness of the um, dielectric. But even 20 years ago, we reached a thickness of around 1 nanometer. And 1 nanometer, just uh, you know, two unit cells. So you cannot really go down further below that. So how do you solve that problem? People said, I have to use a dielectric which has a higher permittivity. Okay? But the problem is, if you want to put any other material than silicon dioxide on silicon, it creates a lot of defects and the current goes down. So we cannot directly put another material of higher permittivity on top. So we need a thin silicon dioxide plus a high K. So essentially, the effect is that I get a thickness, which is the thin silicon thickness, plus some fraction of the higher K material thickness. And the engineering is to make it smaller than, so that's why this is called EOT, effective oxide thickness. The physical thickness is big, but effective thickness is a smaller than what I could afford with just thin SiO2. That way, effectively you have uh, reduce this part and so the capacitance has gone up. So this is in our industry is called the high K metal gate. Intel first commercialized it, uh, although IBM started the research many years before them. And uh, that, uh, you know, completely changed the way we made transistors. Okay. So this is one way of doing it. Another way would be to effectively increase the number of gates. So if I thin down this channel and I can put another gate here, it will look like that I have two gates now trying to control the channel versus one gate. And that way, my gate control goes up. So pictorially, that makes sense, except that building that device uh, is not easy. And the way to do this basically came from Berkeley. That's the uh, famous FinFET where you basically fold the channel in the third dimension and put the oxide and the gate around it. So now you have one gate and the other gate from two sides controlling the channel. Again, the main idea is that you are trying to increase C ox so that you can hold on to the channel control. Right? So if you look at um, in, the, in the last decade, from 2000 to 2010, the big uh, changes in, in our uh, device technology came from high K metal gate and going into FinFETs. And those are the things that we are using today. But going forward, things don't look very hopeful because these are the, uh, so this is this roadmap, uh, which is usually uh, set up by International Roadmap for Devices and Systems Society. It's called IRDS. If you look at our future roadmap, 16 nanometer physical gate length is the next one, 2021. The target was to run it at 0.65 volt. We cannot do that. 16 nanometer LG is coming out, but is running at much larger voltage. Going forward, we actually do not have real known solutions. Uh, you see that going from 14 to 12, the projected date is 2033, because the anticipation is it will take a long time to build that. And below that, 10 nanometer physical gate length, there, there is nothing because we don't know that we can get there or not. Okay? So therefore, we need to think uh, in terms of what we can do to again get back our gate control so that we can uh, do these um, ion, uh, you know, we can turn off the transistor uh, like this black curve. Okay. So if you think about it, this means that we may have to go beyond what the classical electrostatics um, gives us, right? And if you think about this, this is all has to do with the energy dissipation because I on I off essentially tells you how much energy you are going to dissipate giving a particular voltage. So this is where um, we can take a step back and we can try to um, ask what is the fundamentals of energy dissipation? Why do we dissipate um, some energy while I'm trying to switch a transistor on and off, right? So there, um, you know, we go back to thermodynamics and we basically say, okay, total energy is constant. So in any transition trying to go from off to on, the total dissipation is simply change in the free energy, which if you are at the same temperature uh, becomes a change in the entropy. So I um, promise that this is the only slide with equations. 
but I think this is important uh, to know why uh, we are doing what we are doing. So what is the change in entropy? The one way uh, to quickly understand this is any computer is essentially an RC circuit. So when you are applying a voltage, you are charging a capacitor. So if I did not tell you anything about the capacitor, whether it is charged or not charged, you don't know anything. So the entropy is basically 2 to the power n if you had n charges in your uh, computation. But after you apply a voltage, you basically know almost everything about the capacitor because you know that it is charged. So in that case, the degree of freedom has ideally gone down to essentially a 1. So this becomes, this change in entropy becomes log of 2 to the power n minus log of 1, which essentially gives us this quantity which is nkt log 2, which is a celebrated number. You can come to this number from various uh, directions. Information theorists also find this number using the entropy of information. But essentially, this is kind of this ideal limit um, of transition. Uh, in a real device, we are in the same order, but we dissipate more than this because real device is not ideal. There are some, um, uh, you know, there are some non-idealities uh, involved. So if you look at that, the question would be that what can you do about it? Can you somehow change this? So of course, T we cannot do anything. If you are working at a room temperature, we are working at a room temperature. Of course, there is a lot of interest suddenly about cryogenic electronics because uh, data centers are willing to pay for the cooling cost. So if you uh, reduce temperature, you can reduce energy. Kb is a Boltzmann constant. Again, I cannot do anything. N, I cannot do too much because N is the number of charges. If I reduce that, I cannot charge up my circuits as fast as I want. So if I set up a speed, I cannot do too much. So Professor Yablonovich actually comes to this similar um, arguments from a different point of view that there is, a, yeah, there is a mismatch between the number of electrons you need to charge up your wires versus, uh, versus your switching. So if you think about uh, the speed, you cannot do too much about N. So we are kind of we will say that we cannot do anything about this. So, uh, Professor, <laughs> so Eli basically talked about you know my uh, PhD. So I was actually given um, the job of looking at this and saying what can we do. So I said the what what is the most logical is to say somehow I have to reduce n. If I cannot reduce the n as a amplitude as the number, I have to do something so that it looks like smaller n. So if you think about it, the n is coming here because of this degree of freedom had 2 to the power n, right? So you can think about a system where I have n particles, but they are working together. So there are some interactions among them. So it is not that you can completely push them into complete disorder. So this is an example I often use. Uh, there are, let's say, one, two, three, uh, seven kids. If you tell them that they can stand up or sit down whatever way they want, there are two raised to seven ways of arranging them. So that will be their total entropy. But if I say that while doing so, you have to hold your hands, then in the ideal case, they will all stand up together and sit together because there will be, otherwise there will be a strain in the system. So that to me is an example of, an, of a system with interaction. Uh, that is a uh, system which has internal order. In that case, although I have seven kids, they actually, the total degree of freedom is just two. They can all stand up or stand or go down. This way, I can basically take this n out of the equation. So in the ideal case, in this case, the, you know, in the most entropic phase, the degree of freedom is two. In the least entropic phase, the degree of freedom is one. So it simply becomes kt log two, the uh, total dissipation. And that means that this nkt that I was getting, this can ideally become kt. So I can basically take the n out of the, of the equation. So this is the idea that we, um, we at that time, so long time ago now, 2007, we proposed that we need to change to materials which have internal order, which are interacting. Um, and the first uh, example that came to my mind at that time was uh, magnets, because magnets have spins, they interact together, and they all polarize in one direction or the other. And I found very, with a pleasant surprise, that 
you know, there is a magnetic hard disk industry. They have industrial simulator. You take them and use them to simulate the switching of a magnet. So in this case, we, I took a magnetic particle which had two, 10 raised to 4 spins. So based on our previous discussion, to switch them, I should need at least 10 raised to 4 kT. But when I switch them, it just takes around 40 kT. Okay? So much less than that n kT number. And this is already present in our hard disk. So we are already taking advantage of it. And the idea was that can I now use it uh, in addition to using it as a memory, can I use it for a logic application? What I uh, realized is that that is difficult because we don't have a good magnetic sensor. So we can switch the magnets very efficiently, but when I try to sense where the magnet, magnet is, I lose all the efficiency. So a, a state-of-the-art magnetic uh, sensor gives me an on-off ratio of just two. So I cannot really uh, work with that. But there is a charge analog of spins, which is called ferroelectric materials, where the dipoles, again, charge dipoles, interact together to go to look up or down. And we have the best uh, charge sensor in, in terms of a transistor. So the idea was, if I can put these guys, if I can replace the gate insulator by a ferroelectric material, then I can switch with a lower energy and I can sense with the transistor channel underneath. That was a very simple idea. And my thinking was that I have a thermodynamic support that this will be a lower energy switch. It turned out when we looked at it uh, a little bit more deeply is that when you put the ferroelectric uh, dipoles on top of a transistor, it couples with the silicon channel, giving you something called a negative capacitance, uh, which becomes kind of interesting. So let's, let's look at what that is. So I, I'll go through a little bit of five minutes discussion of ferroelectrics uh, in case you don't um, you have not thought about it uh, uh, very deeply before. So ferroelectrics are materials where, as we said, that there are dipoles, there are internal polarization. So think about um, a unit cell. It has some kind of a polarization. Now you have a material, so you're putting many of these unit cells together. If you have dipoles, then electric fields are coming out, and they will interact with each other. So we know how to, uh, for example, if I look at one atom, I know how to calculate the electric field on that one atom. It's just the dipolar interactions. So I can write down uh, this dipolar interaction equation. This is also very well understood, very classical. And if you have a computer, you take a ferroelectric material, put your atomic coordinates, and um, you know, uh, honestly calculate this dipole over the lattice, you actually get the right result. But before uh, computers came along, uh, you know, people seem to be much smarter than today. So <laughs> Slater, uh, in 1951, Slater is um, actually one of the pillars in electronic structure theory. He figured out how a prototypical ferroelectric electric field will look like, uh, just analytically. And you know, this equation is very close to be e almost exact. So if I look at E, and write it as a function of p. So I wrote down these factors because if you are um, uh, uh, if you are familiar with dielectric theory, you will actually see something here. But just um, as an as a question, is the net positive to p or negative to p? If I add all of this, is it positive or negative? It's, it's positive, right? So this much is negative, but this guy makes it positive. So essentially, there is a positive correlation between the electric field that an atom feels due to the dipoles around it and the polarization. Now, polarization comes because there is a little bit of uh, you know, distortion of the electron, electron cloud from the center. So what I'm doing is, in this plot, I'm basically drawing distortion, which is essentially polarization and the force, which is essentially the electric field. So we found that there will be a positive correlation between those two. So it's a straight line like this. But this is a problem, because what it is saying is, if I have a little bit of distortion, the atom feels an electric field, which tries to increase that distortion. Right? So think about it. A material, you cannot change its volume. 
So, if it is distorted and then it creates an electric field which tries to distort it more, it is getting taller and taller and skinnier and skinnier. So, at some point it will explode. So, in textbooks this is often called the polarization catastrophe. Okay. But of course, materials don't really explode like that. That will be a fantastic thing. It does not happen. It does not happen because there is a spring force, which is a very s simple force of material. The spring force tries to push it back. So spring force uh, starts to work against this distortion. And the spring force, again, just uh, spring is kx squared. So if I look at the spring force, it just basically looks like this, a parabola, which changes sign on the two sides. But that's it. So essentially, there are two forces in this material. One is the spring force. The other is this polarization catastrophe. Remember, the polarization catastrophe is happening because of that internal order, because the polarization all want to point to one direction. So one very classical mechanical force is acting against this order that I want to use for uh, you know, lower energy switch. So what happens in this case? If I add these two guys together, I get this blue line. And you can see that for this blue line, in this region the mechanical force wins, in this region the order force wins. But of course the material cannot sit where its net force is not zero. So the material will only sit either here or here or here. Right here, the distortion is zero, so it's a trivial solution. We don't really worry about this. So it, it will sit either here or there. This is why a ferroelectric material gets spontaneously polarized. It goes to a certain polarization where its force because of this electric field is exactly balanced out by the mechanical force. Okay? So remember that force is QE, so this axis is basically proportional to electric field. This axis is distortion. This is basically proportional to polarization. So in the next slide, what I have done is I basically rotated, rotated it in the counterclock direction. As a result, this becomes polarization. This becomes electric field. And I get a curve, which is often called the S curve. Okay? And this curve is sitting right here. Either the material is here or there. If you want to look at the energy, the energy is simply E dot dp, uh, again textbook. So this thing, you do E dot dp, gives you an energy landscape like this. This basically shows that the material will either be stable here or there. And these two stable states are separated by a region where there is, a, there is an energy barrier. Okay. So um, now if you look at this again, you see that this is the region where my order force was winning. This is where I want to use the material to get a lower energy switch. This is also where dQdV or dPdE is less than zero. In other words, there the capacitance is negative. So this fact that capacitance is negative is nothing but a signature of the fact that there was this internal order in the system, nothing else. Okay? And if I correlate it with the energy landscape, this is that part. And this is where you see the energy is higher. This is like a top of the hill. But the bad news is, I, this is basically saying that where the material wants to sit, which is here, which is here, this is equivalent to that, the order force has already been dominated by a mechanical force. So if I just take a ferroelectric material, I cannot take advantage of this at all. Okay? But if I, if I could uh, take advantage of the order, I will get a material which, is, uh, which has a negative capacitance. Okay. So should I uh, even worry about trying to push the material here? What does the negative capacitance bring me? So if you look at a transistor, again, um, I have uh, this oxide capacitance. Let's say I replace that with a negative capacitance. And then I have a semiconductor material which has its own capacitance. So any MOSFET is like a series combination of two capacitors. So we apply a voltage here. We divide the voltage. So let's say I put 1 volt, I get 0.8 volt in the middle. That gives me the current. But if this C1 was in the negative capacitance state, 
then this is over dvg becomes c1 divided by c1 minus c2 and so therefore this is can be larger than dvg so by changing the voltage here by 1 volt i could get 1.3 volt here which means my current iv can you know if this is for a standard transistor the negative capacitance transistor can give me that red curve which means i can reduce my voltage okay so this is if i could get into that negative capacitance region and again if you look at it you don't have to worry about negative capacitance this is happening because thermodynamics told us that it will happen if you could take advantage of that order so somehow i have to get into that region where the order is dominating so one way to do that is to add a capacitor with a ferroelectric how does that work so let's say that this is a standard ferroelectric sitting here or there so let's say here this is a regular dielectric like an SiO2 or whatever so its energy is just q square over twice c so you add this guy with that guy in a series combination the energy will add so this black and blue will add and as a result the composite energy landscape looks like this red curve and now to reduce the energy of the entire system the material can be made to be stable there and in that region ferroelectric has a negative capacitance so uh, Eli said that there were lots of questions that can this actually work so when we first talked about it this is what bothered people a lot because people would say how can a material even if it you know reduces the overall energy can sit at the top of the hill can it even be possible okay and people would not have an answer to how it will not be possible but I have heard like philosophical arguments like nature will find a way to not be there uh, so we'll come to that you know when you f <laughs> so when you just do theory then you know we can always argue that uh, your approximation is better than my approximation or vice versa but that's why you have to do experiments but the summary is that if I can actually do a very good matching between this capacitance and the ferroelectric capacitance I can push the ferroelectric capacitance in this negative capacitance region that is steepens my IV curve as a result I can get the same on off at a smaller voltage ratio and the reason that when I only had a theory no experiments and people would question the reason I pushed with it is because this has nothing to do with negative capacitance this has to do with the thermodynamics thermodynamics is always right and I thought that because the thermo thermodynamics says that this will happen it will happen I just have to push through it so now um, in the next 15 minutes or so or um, I'll try to uh, talk about some of the experimental stuff that we have done so first experiment that we started working with is this uh, this balancing energy balancing the question is can you actually be there can you actually be on the top of the hill and if you look at this red car which is coming from adding the blue with the black you see that this red car I can again uh, you know think that this is a new dielectric with a smaller curvature and if I try to fit a q square over twice c there I'm getting the same charge at a smaller energy which is what I should get from thermodynamics but that basically means that if I get the same charge at a small energy the capacitance has gone up so this is completely opposite to what happens or what the textbook says that should happen the textbook always says that you have two capacitors you put them in series total capacitance is less than either of the two this is saying the total capacitance will be larger right so that was the first experiment we did so this is a dielectric STO strontium titanate and we put a PZT on top of this so tot, you know this is two uh, capacitors in series and actually we were able to show that the capacitance goes up and uh, we did a number of uh, so this was back in 2011 we did a number of experiments after that the good thing is other groups around that time started um, doing similar experiments and getting similar results which um, which made it very robust at that point but of course this is a still an um, indirect measurement of the negative capacitance state so we wanted to do a direct imaging of the material in the negative capacitance state so 
here uh, this PTO is a lead titanate is a ferroelectric material again STO is a dielectric. So, here you can see that we are imaging the polarizations directly. So, this is done at the advanced light source uh, at LBL only they can do this kind of imaging. So, we can actually measure the distortion of the atoms directly and we can see how the polarization looks like. Okay. Now, by sending an electron beam into this material if there is if you send an electric beam into a material which has some electric field in it then the beam will get deflected by measuring that deflection you can actually map out the electric field in the system as well. So, again in textbooks we often tell our students PN junction you cannot measure the built in field actually to now you can because you can see the deflection of the um, uh, of the electric field and David Muller's group at Cornell is one of the pioneers of this technique they uh, did this uh, measurement for us. So, I am coming there, but just to show that this material when we measured the capacitance shows a 3.7 x increase in capacitance. So, this already shows indirectly that uh, it is in negative capacitance state. So, here is the polarization map, here is the electric field map. So, displacement is epsilon e plus p. Now, we have measured both p and e. So, we can directly measure the displacement and the energy is just E dot D D. So, because we have measured E and P we can directly look at energy and we definitely find that the material has this local regions where it is sitting on the top of the hill. So, at this point we are directly imaging a material stabilized in the negative capacitance state. Okay. And uh, the satisfying thing for us was that this is our measured polarization and electric field. Uh, along a along a line uh, here and this is a DFT plus Poisson's equation calculation with this unit cell uh, resolution which actually showed us exactly similar behavior. So, this told us that we are not only just imaging this microscopically we actually have a microscopic understanding of what is going on in, the, in these systems. Okay. So, at this point as an academic I can just stop and move on because I can say ok I had an exotic theory I have imaged it I have proved it I, ha I see capacitance enhancement and that is it. But at Berkeley uh, we want to make an impact as well. So, we also try to work on actual real transistors and there uh, there is a lot of challenge because these materials that I was talking about uh, lead titanate and others they are very good uh, material systems for doing this kind of study you can grow them uh, very well, but they cannot be integrated with silicon. So, we cannot really make transistors out of them. So, we needed a material that we can actually integrate and fortunately um, actually back in 2011 a group from Germany found that you can dope hafnium dioxide which is already in our transistors and make it ferroelectric. So, we quickly did an experiment at that point. Uh, uh, along with a you know in collaboration with a group from Taiwan and we were able to show that in a 30 nanometer channel length transistor this is the baseline IV this is this negative capacitance transistor IV and you can now see that is steepening of the curve that the theory kind of predicted should happen right. So, this uh, back in uh, 2015 uh, we, we did this demonstration after that um, Berkeley Center for Negative Capacitance Transistors were uh, formed here. Uh, some of the leading uh, semiconductor industries came, up, came in and uh, started um, giving us funding to advance this work. But also there was a huge explosion of papers coming out of, from all over the world. So, if you look at our IEDM or VLSI conferences from the last two years you will find multiple sessions just on negative capacitance transistors. So, this has now gone way beyond our uh, own work, but of course, uh, you show something that um, you know the challenges are many. So, we talk about you know 15 nanometer channel length transistors. Or, so, how does a real fin fed looks like? So, this is this Intel fin fed, right? So, you see these fins and the gap between the fins right now is 43 nanometers very small gap. So, the industries come to us and say hey I cannot give you any thickness you want to use for your material you have a good material giving us good ion off, but I do not have a space to put that material. And the target is 1.8 nanometer you cannot go beyond that. 
So that is just 18 angstrom, essentially 3 unit cells of materials that I have to work with. Uh, there is another problem and I can give another uh, big talk on that, but the problem is the, it has been very well known in material science that ferroelectrics below 3 to 3.5 nanometer loses its ferroelectricity for various reasons. So we actually had to do a very in-depth materials um, research to actually get that thickness down um, close to 1 nanometer. So today we can actually get 1 nanometer ferroelectric which, which is again a big advance over what people thought a fundamental limit is. But this is one of our demonstrations with 1.8 nanometer ferroelectric which was the target and again you can see that the, for the same voltage the on off ratio has gone up. So I will uh, just show you one of our latest results. Um, this is again using a hafnium dioxide transistor uh, you get this blue curve using NCFET at a smaller voltage you can hit the same on current but much lower off current. So this is actually directly showing you the voltage scaling. I'm I'm not giving up on current. I get down current. I, I on off, on off ratio is also larger, but the voltage is 30 percent lower. So this is um, where the hope is today. Now five minutes I think I have. Uh, so I'll show you where we are today. What are we doing? Um, so this result, this particular result is um, uh, still unpublished. We are still doing it and the students who are doing it, some of them are here. But the thing is, remember how the high K metal gate came in, we talked about that you, you cannot give up SiO2, so you have SiO2 but you put a high K on top and all you hope is this total effective thickness is less than your whatever you could afford with SiO2. So it will be thickness of SiO2 plus some thickness coming from the extra layer. So here I'm showing one of our stacks where at least from TEM it looks like the SiO2 thickness is 1 nanometer. And this is our capacitance versus voltage data. And the data we simulated with an 8 angstrom EOT oxide. So the data and simulation matches so well that I, we can say that data is equivalent to an 8 angstrom EOT oxide. But that basically says that my EOT is actually less than the SiO2, at least the physical thickness. So this is what I mean by going beyond classical electrostatics. Classical electrostatics will say I have SiO2 thickness plus something, but in the data we are actually getting SiO2 minus something. So that's the hope and if you think about it, this is kind of mind boggling because we are talking about an 8 angstrom EOT, that is a fraction of a nanometer. And you know, nowadays often my students will come and fight over 0.5 angstrom, <laughs> which because actually that makes a lot of difference in how the transistor performs. So uh, of course we have to now go and see how far we can push it down, but uh, recently we did a calculation which shows that if we can go along this path, we can actually support a 9 nanometer channel length transistor. So as we said that right now there is no solution for 12, so there, but there is some hope that we can get there and the roadmap says this will come around 2033. There is no roadmap beyond this but we can actually extend it uh, beyond that so that, I that is the hope. Of course if we can deliver this the way industry works they will not wait until 2033, they will quickly do it and quickly move forward. Uh, but that's uh, that's uh, that's the roadmap for us. So let me uh, end with this particular slide. So in uh, 2017, Global Foundries actually did a very quick um, run on their 14 nanometer platform for negative capacitance transistors. This was not a you know meant to be a fully optimized device. They just uh, did a try and. This is one of their plots from this paper which basically shows that in their ring oscillators if they increase frequency what kind of active power they need, right? And so this trend line basically gives us 1.8 micro watt per gigahertz. So they compared that with the 40 nanometer production uh, that we actually use in our computers today which is 3.2 micro watt per gigahertz. So there is the power dissipation for every gigahertz increase in the speed 
is actually almost half for the negative capacitance transistors. So to me, this kind of embodies, you know, we can talk about physics and many other things, but in the end, this is what we want to see. We, we want to essentially reduce the power uh, for the same uh, frequency. And uh, this is uh, very satisfying in the sense that the negative capacitance, as we, I try to explain, is working, is using a very different physical principle. And this is probably the only result that shows a complete circuit with a transistor which works on a different physical uh, principle, but giving better performance than an incumbent technology. So we are actually uh, comparing with a commercial technology that we are using today. So on that note, um, I'll stop uh, and you know acknowledging my uh, some of my former and current students who are working on this uh, uh, negative capacitance uh, uh, technology, and of course uh, the Berkeley Center for Negative Capacitance Transistors. Uh, this provides us uh, with uh, the funding that we need to actually keep working on it. So let me stop there. Thank you.